Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for coming. Um, I, I um, just a bit of background. Um, I, I was on the other side of the, in the auditorium 15 years ago as, as a graduate student at the University of Toronto. And I sat through many lectures and wishing for it to end. And I, I, I uh, promised myself that if I was in the other position, not in presenting science for the purposes of my doctoral thesis, etc., but in, in a situation like this, I wouldn't want it to be a lecture. I wouldn't want to get up here and stand and read notes and have you all bored to death. Uh, the purpose of the talk today is to talk about patents. And it's, and it's encouraged that you raise your hand, interrupt me, and say, what do you mean by that? Or I this is something that I've been thinking about. Is this something we can talk about in this forum or whatever? So if you have a question during the course of the talk, I'm not going to stand behind a, uh, a podium and give a, a lecture. This is a chance to have a, a discussion about the general aspects of, of patents. There's going to be some stuff right from the beginning uh, for those who who'd have a little bit of expertise in patent protection in me. You know, just not, not over your head in terms of uh, 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 difficult to understand, but over in the head in the sense of glassy-eyed. I've seen this before. Hopefully, there will be some material later on that will that, pique your interest. So there will be some, some material from the very beginning to the, uh, to the very end or during the whole process in between. Um, I'm just a, a, a bit of who I am, I say I'm, I, as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm a, a patent agent at the firm of Osler, Hoskin & Harcourt in Ottawa. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. I make that perfectly clear right up front. Uh, I, I did uh, my PhD at University of Toronto. Uh, I did some uh, fellowship work at Harvard Medical School. And um, I was working in a, in a uh, startup biotech company back in the day in, in, in Ottawa. And uh, I was asked many questions during the course of it. Well, what's your IP portfolio look like? What are your projections for filing applications, et cetera, et cetera? And, and I, I was just a student. I just I just finished my PhD. I'm, I don't know. Uh, what, what is what is IP? This isn't something you learn about typically in an academic setting, especially not in, in a law setting. So it was all new to me, and I joined a law firm back in 2003. Um, out of the blue. I went to a conference, there was a law firm kiosk there and they were, they were doing displays about the well, law of the law office and how they could, how the firm could offer various services. And I said to them, you know, I'm a recent PhD graduate, so I'm, I'm not really interested in lab work. I, 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 in fact, I loathe sitting at the bench and during these experiments. I've done it, been there, done that. I wrote my papers, got my grant proposals in. I just don't want to do it anymore. But I love the science. I love the I love, I, I love it. I just love the science. I just don't want to do it. <laughs> I like writing about it, but I don't actually want to sit at the bench and do it. And they said, we've got a job for you. And that was, you know, that was 12 years now. Uh, I've been at, uh, was at a firm before the Osler. I've been at Osler for five and a half years now. And it really was a wise career path for me. And many people out there in this audience or elsewhere who may or may not have a passion for actually doing the lab work have the passion for the science and where it can take you in, in, in commercializing it, in making it valuable, maybe taking it to a company, maybe taking it to investors, and really making a difference in a commercialized setting. Uh, this, is a, this is definitely a career path uh, that is, is, is of it, could be of interest to you. Uh, so as I said, this is, this is a general talk about, about patents. Uh, there are other aspects of intellectual property, which I won't go into, things like trademarks and copyright and designs and so on. Uh, this is just for patents, and as, as uh, let me just uh, you know here, as I do come from a law firm, there is the the required disclaimers. Uh, this will be a general talk of general nature. This does not constitute a solicitor client or pat or patent agent client discussion. Uh, the topics we discuss will be of general nature. If you had specific uh, topics, questions about specific technology, uh, I'd be happy to discuss them with you. Of course, I'd have to send you a bill after. So we'll, <laughs> I, I joke, we'll leave, that, we'll leave that to the side. Uh, but all kidding aside, this is, this is more for general discussion purposes uh, and does not constitute uh, a, a conflict of interest to, to, to any discussions uh, go beyond the scope of this talk. So what is a patent? Simple question. It doesn't give you license to do anything. It actually is the opposite. It prevents others from making, using, or selling your invention. 
It is a monopoly. It is a true monopoly. You, you, in exchange for the full disclosure of your invention to the government agency, whether that be Canada, the U.S., the European Patent Commission, uh, Japan, China, India, etc., they will grant you a monopoly for your invention. Um, it doesn't give you the right to practice your invention. It, you certainly can. In fact, that's what you want to do. You have an invention. You have an idea. You have something you want to commercialize. By all means, that's a different, that's a different avenue. That's actually using your invention commercially for the purposes of generating revenue streams, generating partnerships. A patent does not do that. It, in fact, it, it prevents others from making, using, or selling. As an example, those of you who have not seen what a U.S. patent looks like, as, an, as one example of the many different patents, and I'll just also preface here that a patent is national, and I sort of alluded to it earlier. A patent is national. It is a U.S. patent, Canadian patent, Japanese patent, Australian patent, Ugandan patent, etc., etc. Uh, there are certain regions in the world which issue patents. They have certain rights that extend uh, uh, multi-jurisdictionally. Generally speaking, though, a patent is a country national patent. There's no such thing as a worldwide patent. We'll get to the worldwide aspect in a few slides, but if you hear that from anyone, oh, I got a patent around the world, or I'm filing around the world, mm, I, I'll believe it when I see it. If they have an application pending in every country in the world, and they've got $20 million uh, ready to spend on, on, on filing those applications, by all means, they're entitled to do so. But a patent looks like this, generally speaking, in the US. You have a cover page, you may have seen the cover page, um, pretty much standard issue. Uh, you can't read it, I don't expect you to read any of the text here, it looks, it's a little bit blurred, but there usually has uh, the number, which is in the top right. I see if the pointer works here. So you have the US patent number, 8282928. In this particular example, I just pulled it randomly out of the hat. Happens to be the Governor's University of Alberta, how about that? Maybe it's not random. Um, I, anyways, uh, this is um, as the date of the patent, which the patent issued October 9, 2012. It has the first named inventor, the title, it has the list of the inventors and the assignee, that is the person who owns the rights to that invention as of the time this was patented. Uh, so some search information, there's the filing date, filing, filing number, uh, some, some general tombstone information, cited references, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, just like a journal article that you would submit to nature or science or whatever, you're going to have things like graphs. You're going to have uh, a, a summary of the invention, the background. It's usually what we have here is the background of the invention. What's the state of the art? Well, so-and-so lab and such-and-such -and -such did this and such-and-such -and -such did that and, hey, we found the following. And it, it overcomes some of the problems and challenges that, that have been faced in the prior art. That is, everything that existed before you filed the application. Uh, so it contains this, the summary of the invention. It includes a detailed description. And it may include some tables. And as I mentioned, when you, when you get the monopoly, when you get that rights, the exclusive rights for that particular country, you have to, in exchange for that, have to disclose how the invention works. In many countries, it's called the best mode. If you know how the best mode of your invention works, I have to put this reagent at this temperature, or this temperature range, or this range of chemicals with this substituent on the benzene ring, for example. This group, this group of chemicals at this particular condition will achieve the desired result of whatever that may be. If it's a pharmaceutical, does it, does it produce a kind of pharmaceutical result that you're, des that you're desiring for that purpose? Uh, and then at the end, it, you get the claims. The claims, from a patent agent point of view, are the most important, generally the most important part of the patent document. Um, the, the front end of the document, if you will, that is to say the background, the summary of the invention, the detailed description of the invention, the examples you used, uh, uh, the, the various tests you ran, the graphs, the tables, that pretty much is everything that you did. You as the inventor did. You come to me and say, I want to get a patent, I take care of the claims. And we work together work to, get, to get the claims in, in motion. But the claims are the legal part, the, the whole patent is a legal part, but the claims are the legal part for the purposes of things like what are the meets and bounds, as they say, 
and in this case I, we use the fence as an analogy, of where your invention is. Your invention lies within the fence. Anything outside the fence, anyone else can have. Or maybe you may not necessarily want to give it to the rest of the world, but for the purposes of a patent, the fence defines where your invention lies. Uh, examiners go jump right to that first. When I say examiners, you say, who's the examiner? We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, when you are looking at the various jurisdictions, you're going, to, you're going to look at the claims and say, what exactly are you claiming as your own? What are you claim? If you think about it, what am I claiming? I'm claiming if I'm going to a gold mine, I'm claiming this land or this mine or this, this, this parcel of land as mine. I'm claiming this chemical or this group of chemicals as mine. Uh, and that is, defines what your invention is and what you are seeking protection for. Any questions so far? Okay. So what can I get a patent for? Um, there's, there's different definitions around the world of what is considered patentable. Uh, generally speaking, and I'll give an example of Canada, invention means any new and useful art, process, machine, manufacture, composition of matter, any new or useful improvement of any of such things. So you can have the latest mousetrap, literally. The old mousetrap is a problem because maybe it has the spring loaded is, is to, it, it, can, it can hurt the person who is putting the cheese on the mousetrap. Or maybe it's inhumane. Or maybe it's, uh, the spring could get corroded. I'm, I'm just rhyming things off the top of my head here. Those are some of the problems that exist with the existing mousetrap. You come along with an improved mousetrap. You can't claim a mousetrap anymore. That's done. But you can always, always claim the improvement. And what would that improvement be? For the improvement, or in the case of a new invention, the, the invention has to meet four basic criteria pretty much around the world. And how they're defined it depends on the jurisdiction. But for general purposes, it has to be new. That seems reasonable. It has to be what's called inventive or non-obvious. And that can be defined a little bit more loosely depending on the jurisdiction. Uh, it has to work. So the claims to perpetual motion machine They've been tried and, and failed. And it has to be directed to what's called patentable subject matter. And we'll go through each of those briefly just to show you what we mean by that. So patentable subject matter has taken various forms over the years. Um, but generally speaking, it can include a manual or productive art that makes a vendable product. It has to be something that you can sell. Um, a, a painting isn't necessarily vendable. It's vendable, but it's not necessarily a, a patent. If you made a new paint that adheres to the canvas better, or some kind of modification, that might be or chem the chemical itself. You know, that might be something that's patentable. The art itself is not. Uh, the process, a pro any kind of process. So I, I use examples where you're in a mine shaft and you're looking for uh, a method of extracting that that mine of that uh, material from the mine. You think about it this way, anyone can dig a hole, but how you got there, how you found the gold, how you extracted it from the mine is likely patentable. Uh, the machine, so a, a machine that, uh, that is a me mechanical, we call a mechanical embodiment of a function. So it is a tangible object, uh, which, which could be anything really. Um, or composition of matter, which generally means anything that doesn't fit any of those criteria. Uh, in, in the chemistry department, of course, a, a chemical compound would likely be a composition of matter. A pharmaceutical composition, a drug, for example, might, be, might fall into the, those categories. And I've just given some just general, general examples of random claims. Uh, as there are patentable subject matter, there is non-patentable subject matter. And again, as I say, this has sort of evolved in the various jurisdictions. Um, a song is not patentable. It may be copyright, but it's not patentable. Uh, it, it, it is an art. It is not necessarily a, a patentable subject matter. Uh, e equals mc squared, not a patentable subject matter. It's a scientific principle or abstract theorem. Um, business methods, and this has been a thorn in my uh, my profession, for a period of time, especially in the U.S., but in many jurisdictions, a method of doing business, such as, for example, um, PayPal. 
a method of transaction where you enter a credit card number to make a purchase. The process goes through a server. The server spits, goes through something, spits back information to you, and then you, and then you receive the good a couple of days later. Uh, generally speaking, they're patentable, but we're seeing now that they're not patentable under special circumstances. Um, methods which require professional skill. Uh, the big one is a method of medical treatment, which is um, a, a method of treating cancer comprising administering a drug to a patient in need thereof. That's an example of a claim which is perfectly valid on its face, uh, but in many jurisdictions is not because it is a method that a physician who has specific training would need to require to administer that drug. A uh, method of playing games generally not patentable. Things that are not re reproducible, things like breeding animals, plants. Um, in certain jurisdictions, I can think of Europe, for example, uh, there is subject matter which contravenes public morality. And I use this extreme scenario, a novel weapon of mass destruction. Does it meet the criteria of novelty? It might. Is it not obvious? Maybe. Uh, does it work? Probably. Uh, is it patentable subject matter? Probably not. And in many jurisdictions, if it contravenes what's considered the ordre public, as they say in French, then it would necessarily be, not be patentable subject matter. That being said, in many other jurisdictions it is. And, and there was a, a rule of thumb that was coined many years ago in the U.S. about anything which is under the sun can be patentable. That has changed a lot over the years. And in, in certain aspects, in certain domains, uh, th that has, uh, has gone away. The last big one here is higher life forms. And in the U.S. and other jurisdictions, you, you can get a higher life form claim. So claim, when I say claim to a mouse, a modified, genetically modified mouse, which has uh, uh, a certain gene knocked out, for example, or a plant which has been genetically modified to resist a certain uh, weed treatment, or, or et cetera. Uh, there are ways that I, as the patent agent, can craft that so we can get around some of those, those, those uh, restrictions. The plant, per se, in some jurisdictions is not patentable. The method of making the plant might be, or the use of the plant or the seed of the plant. There's many different ways that you can uh, get around that. All right, the big one is novelty. And I, I have a few slides on this just to give you a general idea. Novelty is the bane of existence. Yes, questions back. Um, back when you talked about medical treatments. Yes. Could you patent, we've had discussions, a, let's say a surgical intervention for making an animal model to test things. Is that patentable? Depends on how it's worded and it depends on the jurisdiction. Uh, I would say, generally speaking, the U.S., that might work. Uh, for places like Canada, you'd have to do things like uh, a use of a particular implement for achieving uh, a modified surgical, uh, the modified product, whatever that may be. So the technique is impenetrable unless you put a, an implant or some kind of product. So if, if the implant, for example, causes a particular change in the animal that you're, that you're using, you can say, the, for example, the use of the implant for uh, treating or, or achieving whatever the, your, your downstream effects are. The actual surgical method is patentable, generally speaking, in the U.S. and many other jurisdictions, but uh, in many other places it's not. It has to be rewritten. As I say, there are usually ways to get around it. You'd have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Yes, Elizabeth. So if you have a mouse that you have modified to have a humanized liver, yes. The mouse itself is patentable, uh, should be patentable in the U.S. I mean, assuming it meets all of the criteria. The mouse itself, uh, in other jurisdictions, it may not be. The method of, method of modifying the mouse to have that liver, genetically, yes, is, is usually patentable. But that's a method, uh, a method of modification. It's not a method of treatment, so it doesn't fall into that criteria, but it is a, it is a method which produces a, an economically desirable, uh, feasible result at the back end. Uh, the mouse itself, though, is usually not patentable in many jurisdictions. Novelty is a very important feature, and it is, the, as I say, the bane of, the, of existence because, um, especially in the academic setting, there are some uh, there's, there's there's some concerns sometimes that that uh, some of our clients come to us and say, "I don't know if I just shot myself in the foot from a patent point of view." Um, 
there's the old expression, publish or perish, in the academic world, which was, I'm sure is still prevalent today. In the patent world, it's publish and you will perish, not or. <laughs> It's, uh, it's an unfortunate consequence of novelty provisions which exist around the world. And in many jurisdictions, I'm not saying all, but many, especially places like Europe, if you have disclosed it or if someone else has disclosed it, it is no longer an invention. It is no longer patentable. How you disclose it, what you disclose, what is the forum for disclosure, those are all questions I am asked frequently, and these are questions you have to consider if you're looking for patenting your invention. Uh, but generally speaking, generally, again, as I said at the outset, this is a general concept. If it has been disclosed anywhere by you or by someone else, it is no longer patentable. Europe makes it crystal clear. An invention shall be considered to be new if it does not form part of the state of the art. And then it defines what the state of the art is. Everything made available to the public by means of a written or oral description by use in any other way before the date of filing of a European patent application. So that means basically if you don't file the European patent application in this case uh, and you've already disclosed it, it is no longer patentable in Europe. Now there are escape hatches that exist. First of all it depends on what you disclosed. And if you come to me and say, David, I, I, I got this presentation I'm giving in Dusseldorf tomorrow morning. I'm leaving on the plane right now. Basically, I'm telling them everything about what my, how my, my, my chemical works. I'm going to show them the structure. I'm going to show them the reaction conditions, the scheme, uh, the reaction products. And then I'm going to show some of the applications afterwards. But I'm not going to bring a, 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 a test tube with me. I'm not going to actually show the reaction to the person. But I'm going to tell them about it because this is an important conference I'm going to be giving at, and they want to know. I would tell you, do you want to get a patent for this in pretty much anywhere in the world? And if the answer is yes, then I roll up my sleeves and we say, let's get to work because we have to file a patent application immediately. If you file a patent application today, and you disclose it tomorrow, you're pretty much off the hook. And when I say disclose the invention, I mean, what constitutes the disclosure of the invention? Is it enabling? Enabling has a very broad definition, but generally speaking, if, if you were to disclose to your colleague the nature of your invention, and they could take that, write it down, and go back to the lab and reproduce what you just said and produce the same result, generally speaking, that's giving it away. <laughs> that's letting the cat out of the bag. That's enabling. Otherwise, if you, for example, gave, put an abstract together for a conference, you're going to be presenting in Dusseldorf, and you said to submit that abstract last month, and it just generally touches on, I've got a new chemical compound that, uh, that is used for treating cancer. Uh, it it's, it's, uh, uses, uh, you know, use general, again, <laughs> what's the general term? But if you just put it, sort of gloss over what the invention could be, kind of, sort of, is, without actually giving the meat and potatoes of the invention, that may not be enabling, and that could save you. So you have to be careful of what you're actually disclosing. If you have any questions, you talk to, if you're the PI, you talk to me, or talk, if you're a student, you talk to your PI, you talk to me. Uh, eventually, everything comes to me. I'll tell you what, it, what, what you need to do. Um, so you have to be careful of who disclose. The other point to consider is what we saw in the, in the other slide was public disclosure. <coughs> For all intents and purposes, this is a public disclosure. If I were to stand up here and tell you about my invention, notwithstanding the fact we're in uh, a room that holds, say, 50, 75 people, that it was an advertisement on, uh, on Patents 101, as it were, and it's only open to the University of Alberta students and faculty, and no one else is here. I mean, we have a camera here, but no one, no media is here. Um, well, maybe that's not disclosure. I'm not going to, if I start talking about my invention, then that's, no, it's disclosure. For all intents and purposes, if it's di disseminated into the public, outside the four corners of your lab, generally speaking, generally speaking, it's public disclosure. It can include me standing up here talking about an invention in public, orally. It can include a printed or digital publication. It can include offer to sale, sell or public sale of, of, the, of the item. 
It can include the oral presentation in Dusseldorf that I mentioned. It could include the posters that I see lining the hallway. And it could include any disclosure that you make to an investor, for example, or any kind of third party where there is not a protection of a non-disclosure agreement. That wouldn't necessarily be uh, a public disclosure. Any of those and, and many others would jeopardize the patentability of your invention and make it no longer novel. That could be a problem. And, and in the academic setting, I, I, I understand completely, I've been there, you got to get that paper filed because your grant is coming up and you have to make sure you got these papers uh, uh, published and, and ready to go. If you have any inkling of getting a patent for anything of that nature in the, the contents of the document that you're going to be presenting, that you're going to be publishing, and you want to get a patent for it, file a patent application, come and see me. Because that's the most important uh, with, with respect to patenting. Yes? Is submitting something for review constitute? Generally speaking, no. If you're going submitting to a peer review journal, for example, or a granting agency, generally speaking, it, uh, unless there is any explicit indication otherwise, it's usually considered to be a confidential uh, disclosure. So it would, not con it would not constitute novelty. Now, heaven forbid the reviewer takes your document, goes out for a drink and leaves the document on a bar stool and leaves and someone else picks it up and reads it and goes to the press and announces it, it's disclosed. Did you disclose it? No, you would disclose it under the, under the guise that there would not be any public disclosure. If it ever got disclosed, however, it still constitutes disclosure. Well, there's, again, a certain escape hatches that we can use in that context. But generally speaking, any kind of confidential, if you were to talk to me, in fact, under the, under the guise of patent agent client, and you talk to me and say, I have an invention, I'm sworn by confidentiality. I would not disclose it uh, because your disclosure to me does not constitute a, a bar to novelty. Yes? I'm sorry, part of me. I, again, it, 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 it depends. It's hard to say from grant application to grant application. Generally speaking, I, if you are uncertain, I would err on the side of caution and file the, file the patent application, file a provisional before you file it. If there, if there is any kind of doubt, if, there is, if, there's, if there's a certain degree of confidence with that you're submitting a document to an agency which will keep it confidential, usually, or sometimes it'll say in the guidelines, the instructions, then that would be an indication to me that there is a, an, an understanding of confidentiality. Again, with the caveat that you are still submitting it to the public, and while it may not be a bar to novelty, should it ever be disseminated, accidentally or otherwise, it may still constitute a bar to novelty. Um, we talked about the enabling disclosure. Uh, maybe we'll just skip over this. Uh, one thing to consider also, and, and, and many many uh, astute uh, uh, inventors who have filed their patent application. They're all excited. They, 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 they listen to David and they said, I filed my patent application before I give that conference. And then they talk about what's in their patent application and they go and talk about other stuff. And just because you filed a patent application does not mean you can tell the world everything about anything that you want about your invention. What you are now obligated to do is to maintain the four corners of the patent application. So if you are going to be presenting a conference with a deck of slides uh, that you have a certain ke a chemistry involved and you have certain aspects and you come to me and we file that patent application and everything's great, it's filed, it's in the USPTO or wherever it is, and then you go to that conference, you are now going to dis display and talk about what was in your patent application only. Once you start going to possible improvements, possible modifications that were not disclosed, taught, or suggested in the application that you filed, you run the risk excuse me, of that new stuff being now publicly disclosed. So you have to be careful when you do that as well as when you go to a conference after you filed your patent application is that you limit it pretty much to what you actually filed, if, if possible just that. There's going to be questions asked by the audience, I'm sure. There's going to be other, other avenues that may open the can of worms a little bit. If you can avoid that at all possible, uh, then please do so for the purposes of maintaining uh, your invention. Uh, <coughs> this is a lot of text here. I don't want you to read it. You can read it at your leisure, if you will. But um, there are two, two sections of the Patent Act, which is the saving grace. 
in Canada and the U.S., there are certain other jurisdictions under very certain limited circumstances, but for the, all intents and purposes, these are two of the main countries in the world that offer the get-out-of-jail-free card, as it were, when it comes to disclosure, and that's what's called the grace period. It can be relied on only if necessary, and I would not, I would not recommend using it unless you have to. But if you are the inventor and you accidentally or on purpose disclosed your invention less than one year ago, you can still file in Canada and not have that disclosure constitute a bar to novelty. As it says here, highlighted in red, it, it, patent, or, or just to go to the, the beginning part in Canada, subject matter defined by a claim in an application for a patent must not have been disclosed more than one year before the filing date by the applicant or by a person who obtained knowledge directly or indirectly. So if you went and you disclosed it, and you said to me, crap, what am I going to do now? I, so it was six months ago, and I want to get, I got investors who want to look at this, and I, I want to get a patent. Well, your options are not completely off, off the rails. You can file in Canada, in, in, and in the U.S. there are s similar provisions, whereby you can file the application if you file it within one year from the date of disclosure in that particular country. Again, there are other countries, certain very, very strict conditions. Uh, I know it, the mention where I mentioned earlier about the, the guy who leaves it on the bar stool, uh, the, the, uh, the application. Um, if someone use, abused a particular privilege and disclosed an application, disclosed an invention where they weren't entitled to. In certain jurisdictions, you are entitled to say six months, for example, to w within that period to file the application. So all is not lost if you have had to disclose it, but just don't do it <laughs> because if there's, you've limited yourself. Europe, you can't do it unless, again, with, with certain circumstances. Uh, there's certain grace periods in Japan, Australia, but again, they're to be used as emergencies only. The other point on the, the, the four prongs of, of what is an invention is, is what's called inventive step or non-obviousness. Um, the example I use is if, when, when, you, when, you write a, when you write an article, a journal article, you, um, you talk about a lab in, uh, at Stanford did, did, did this and uh, we looked at that lab and we, we saw that they, did, they, they modified it with this, with that chemical compound. And then a lab in, uh, say, uh, Yale did this. And what we are doing is taking a bit of this one and a bit of this one, and we're putting it together, and we've come up with our own results. We've, taken, we've been inspired by their work, which is perfectly reasonable. That's how science works. We, we, we are inspired by, we look at the past, we look at the prior art, as it were, and we see what other people have done. We make modifications, we make it better, and we make our, our own uh, publications for, for the, the betterment of science and research. In patents, that doesn't work. <laughs> That's completely opposite to what, you, what is an invention. It has to be the proverbial spark of lightning, the, the flip of the switch, the light bulb. If that occurs, that is not a, a, a result of obviousness. That is not the result of taking A and B and C, combining them together and putting, putting it together in some kind of logical way. Because if that was a logical way, then anybody could have done that. That's not new, and it's also considered obvious. The definitions vary. The levels of, stringency, levels of stringency vary from country to country. Generally speaking, if anyone could, could have done it and it would have been obvious to try, why not? Let's throw a, a fluorine group on that and see what happens. If you would have thought that any kind of halogen would have done the same thing, it probably is obvious. If it is not, because you found surprisingly that, hey, I stick a methyl on there instead, Look what happens. The, 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 the PK goes off out, out, out the door. It's, it's completely different. It's, it's, com it's a completely unexpected result. That is usually the invention because nobody would have expected that. Nobody would have, been well, nobody would have considered it obvious to try. All right. Uh, any questions at this point about the getting? So you, now you're, you're, you're sitting in the lab and you've got these, these four things to consider novelty, obviousness, patentable subject matter, and if it actually, assuming I didn't go into utility, but assuming it works. So um, there's, there's usually, before we get into the, sort of the nuts and bolts of the process, uh, the, the patenting process is usually, I, I think about it as a three, sort of three zones. And I, I, there's no hard, fast rule. This is, just, this is just what I would consider. 
you have what's the first part, which is, which is called the invention. And that's you guys. That's you sitting in the lab, hours and hours of blood, sweat, and tears, going through the invention. How is it going to work? Does this work? Hey, why not try this? It works. Look at that. Something amazing. There's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be a sign you saw a wave of pits and valleys where, peaks and valleys where you have come up with a solution or you may not have. Then you decide, I'm going to file a patent, a, 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 file a patent application. And I'll call this part, for the sake of argument, agency. And that's me. You come to see me. And in this process, basically what we're going to talk about now, is where I come into play. Me as me, a firm, your patent professional, who takes all of your work and converts it into a legal document, which is something that's going to stand, hopefully stand the test of time, or at least 20 years, because that's usually the lifespan of a patent in around the world. And this, this, there's going to be overlap. We have some discussion here at the front end about what constitutes your invention. What, are, what is the secret sauce, as it were, the meat and potatoes? And then we file the application and we go through the process. And this process will also have its peaks and valleys. As some of you who have worked with me, worked with our firm uh, on applications of your own, you'll know that some examiners around the world uh, don't know anything about science. <laughs> uh, they may not know something about patent, uh, patent protection, about what novelty is, what a prior art document looks like. But what happens during this process is, 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 the, is what I do and, and the decision that you need to make, and we'll get to that, the last one here, we'll call that enforcement, we'll leave that for the moment. What the decisions you make before you come to see me um, are, are, are things that we can discuss as a team as to what is the best strategy for uh, getting a patent and, and going forward. Uh, just a few points there, not an exhaustive list. You have a document that you may call an invention disclosure. I don't know if that's the term that you use um, here, where you, you have a fill out a form. Uh, what's the state of the art? What's the background? Uh, what are some of the problems that the, that, uh, <coughs> that the art has faced, that the, this particular chemical uh, comes along with? What are some of the problems, etc.? Then you say what your invention is. We've done the following. We found that the following reagents work better, the following chemistry, the following conditions, the following whatever, and you disclose the nature of your invention. That package of documents which includes background, which includes your invention, any graphs and tables and so on, you, you send to me and say, I want a patent based on this. And this is, this is the package of materials that you may have prepared internally. Uh, your IP committee, whether it be your PI, whether it be yourself, your team, your colleagues, uh, Elizabeth or, or whoever, will, come to, will decide amongst yourselves whether there's a budget for this whether there is an uh, there's obviously an academic incentive, but is there a, a commercial incentive down the road? Are there going to be investors? This is this something we could potentially use for licensing down the road? Is something where we can generate revenue? Uh, then you get to that point and say, okay, now you've got that. What's, what, how can we extract this to make it a patent? And then we go through the different parts. Is it useful? Well, assuming it, it actually works. Is there prior art? You guys know better than me what the prior art is because you've already done that step. Uh, is there any pending or past disclosure from you guys or from anyone in, in the public? Um, and then, as I said before, does it have any, any value? And that can tie into any of the points raised above. So, do you want to pursue patent protection? Let's say, let's say for the sake of argument, yes, it is. And, and again, yeah, best means for protection, uh, probably a patent. Um, what do you do next? Do a search. Search the prior art. I recommend you do it yourself. We can do it ourselves as a firm. We can hire out to our, our, our colleagues who are professional searchers. Look at Google. Look at your PubMed. Look at your, uh, if you have access to patent databases, publicly available patent databases. SIPO, which is Canadian Patent Office, is available online. USPTO, available online. Uh, IP Australia, uh, EPO, all of these ones, you type in keywords, you can pull up a, a, a multitude of patent related documents. These can be patent applications or they can be patents that have actually been granted. Um, let's assume for the sake of argument you've got your, 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 your package of prior art, you're pretty confident, yeah this is great, we're, we're, we're set. We don't have it, we don't, we're not, uh, we've got something new and we've got something that we can argue is inventive and it works and it's patentable. Mm -hmm. 
Then we actually draft it. And you probably heard someone say drafting an application is basically writing the document, and that's where I step in. I take your invention disclosure and I put it into a nice package, and I write it up, and I put some little subtle nuances in there that are patentees. Um, in accordance with one aspect of the present application, there is provided a whatever a um, a four fluorinated benzene compound which has uh, the properties of uh, curing cancer. I don't know, for example. And then I disclose that and we talk about that. We go through the detailed description of the invention. You remember when we saw the patent, how we have the different sections. We put that into a package. Now, <clears throat> usually speaking, you file an application and you say, well, David told me at that talk that there, every country in the world has a patent. And I can imagine it's going to be a couple of thousand dollars minimum for file an application in each of those countries. Then you've got to have them draft the application. Uh, I don't have the budget or the interest in Uganda or Australia or all of South America. I want Canada, the U.S., maybe Europe, maybe Japan, maybe China, maybe India, maybe one other country. I don't know. You don't know. That's fine. Don't worry about it. You file what's called a provisional application, a U.S. provisional. It's a flag. It's planting the flag. Novelty, as I mentioned at the outset, is important. If you are the first, then everyone else comes after you. You are the prior art. You want to be the prior art. So you plant your flag and you file what's called the U.S. provisional. All that is, is it has, it's very important, but it, all it is for the purposes of a patent document is not a patent. It's a document which is filed in the U.S. Patent Office. It's a preliminary application. It has a lifespan of 12 months. It's not examined or published. And it serves as the basis of priority. There's a lot of meat in, that, in that, those four bullet points. I get it. And I, I'm happy to answer your questions on, on any of those. But what that does is it says, I'm not sure where I want to get patent protection, but I want it. And I want to start the clock. You plant the flag now. I file a patent application today. I can present in Dusseldorf tomorrow. I'm safe. You have now, the clock starts one year from today to file the next application. What that next application is, is entirely up to you, but you have exactly one year. And in that one year, you may make improvements, you may find investors, you may find that certain things don't work as well as, you should, as they should or you thought they did. Uh, there may be various things that can happen in that year, but you do have a year. And when you get to that end point of that year, you come to me or you come to your come to Elizabeth or whoever it may be and say, okay, I'm at 11 months and two weeks. I'm, I have to file this. I, I have the, the, the year clock is ending. I have to file another application. I don't know. I still don't know where I'm going to be filing. I don't know yet. I'd like to have a few countries, but I'd like to maybe, maybe down the road we might have more. Is there any way that we can, we can, we can use that, that time? And there is. And this is what's called a PCT. You probably heard that before, a Patent Cooperation Treaty. Application, I stress, it is an application only. It is not a patent. It is an application. It is a means, a mechanism of getting 140 some odd countries in one shot. You file the application 12 months, within 12 months after you file your, pro your provisional application. Um, the provisional application, I'll, I'll just clarify here, could be any country in the world, but for the purposes of discussion, I've used the U.S. provisional as an example. Anyways, you file that earlier application, 12 months later, you file the PCT. It is a mechanism to delay. Delays costs, delays time, delays decision making. In fact, you get 30 months from the date of that first, remember we planted the flag of the U.S. provisional? You got 30 months, so two and a half years. So you've got that one year, but you've got another 18 months after that in order to decide where I want to get a patent. Where am I going to, where am I going to get the money for it? Where am I going to get the investors for it? Uh, am I going to be selling this product in, in a certain country? Delays significant costs, and it gives you the most important, and there's a sort of a map of the, pretty much all the countries in the world, with a few notable exceptions that are subscribers to the PCT. It gives you your first search report. Is it, in fact, novel, non-obvious, non, uh, inventive? Does it work? Is a patentable subject matter? This is the first where an official government agency will tell you that. Again, it's not a patent. You do not have this and say, hey, I have a patent. You have an application which allows you the opportunity to get a sense of what the examiner considers to be prior art. Now, the examiner considers to be prior art, that can mean but just, it could be just, hey, 
he, he or she is looking through the prior art, just as you did, they found an application, or they found, a, they found in this case, a couple of patent applications, a couple of U.S. patents, and they said that that was the prior art. Your invention does not meet those four criteria. You have to change your application, that is, amend the claims. You have a chance to argue that. The examiner provides an opportunity for you to say no. And this is the first chance to see whether or not you want to continue with the process. Because you have to determine at the outset if, if I'm going to be filing, and these are important parts to consider even before you get to the PCT process, but also before you even go on to the further countries down the road. And I'll show you a very detailed timeline. We won't go into too many details, but you have to be forwardly thinking as you do this uh, process. Are there going to be filing in other countries? Uh, is there going to be further development? And in that 12-month period, was there enough significant improvements to justify filing the application at the, at, at the outset? Because once it goes into the process, now it's under the scrutiny of the various patent offices. And the PCT office is that first office to op offer you that, uh, that, uh, that opportunity. When you get the uh, results from the PCT office, and again, early on in the process, you have to consider, are, are we going to be selling this product in various jurisdictions? Are we really going to be selling this in Uganda? Maybe this is an African... Uh, tr drug for treating AIDS, maybe, and they mean South, South, uh, Southern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa might be a market. Um, where in the pipeline are we? Are we in the early developments? Is this a drug that, that is going to be, you know, have to go through, through clinical trials? Are there going to be uh, red tapes to deal with down the road? Again, this is, these are some of the decisions that you are ongoing, ongoing uh, as, you, as you go through the process. Uh, can we delay and then enforcement will get to uh, a little bit later. But just these are just things, things to think about. And when you're in the PCT stage, it's very critical. You, you should have already thought about this, but when you get to the PCT stage, and then you actually get the results from a first office, which is the PCT office, the examiner will tell you if any of these that you thought of it during the, and at the beginning are going to be uh, an obstacle down the road. This is just uh, a graph. I'm, I'm going to speak to briefly about what the different timelines are. This was where we planted the flag, and we called the priority. You may hear things like a priority application, a U.S. provisional, a claim, a claim date, uh, a priority date. These are pretty much interchangeable. This is the date you first planted the flag and filed that initial application at time zero. This is the 12 months, so as I mentioned, 12 months later, for example, you can file a PCT. Now, if you're all set and say, hey, I don't, I don't want to file a PCT. I know I'm going to be filing in the U.S. and Canada, period, full stop. You file in Canada and the U.S., have a nice day, you deal with those countries and, and carry on your merry way and hopefully get patents down the road. Once you file the application, though, if you file the PCT, it becomes public in 18 months. So between time zero and time 18, it is secret. It is, pub it is not public, publicly available. And that may be an issue if you're looking for prior art, because if you're looking for patent prior art, the application may not be published yet. That could be an advantage or, or an important tool if you are filing different applications for yourself, because you don't want your own application, which publishes here, to be your own prior art. That can be bad as well. So just to keep that in mind. So you file the patent application. Again, I stress it's an application. 30 months comes along. You remember that 30-month date I mentioned from, from time zero. You have to decide where I want to get a patent. This is, the t this is the time. I want to get a patent in country X, Y, Z, whatever. This is an application anymore. It's an application still, but it is, a t it is an opportunity to get a patent. You can pick Canada, you can pick the U.S., or you can pick any other country you want. That's, if you file the PCT, it was one of those 148 I mentioned previously. You could file 148 applications. The thing is, though, when you file this PCT, as I said, it was a mechanism. It wasn't 148 patent applications. It represents 148 applications. With sufficient interest, based on the list I showed you earlier, and budget, this could be down here, because you could have a whole selection of countries that you're interested in. Each of those countries will have a process called prosecution. And that is right in this middle section where the, 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 the sign, well, you can't really see it. I guess it's not, not too right. But this, is the, this part is called the, is prosecution. 
in the agency module whereby we get those reports that I showed you from the PCT office. Now Canada wants to issue one because they have their own set of laws. U.S. has got one. Uh, Europe, Japan, China, Australia. They've each got their own sets of laws. They've each got their own sets of examiners and they're each going to examine your application for its merits on those four points and other formalities in the application which you can deal with uh, as you go along. That time period, and uh, you know it's from here, there's, there's, no, there's no time frame for that. It could be as quick as six months, it could be 15 years. And, 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 and the, the ultimate goal is to get a patent which has a lifespan of 20 years from the filing date. Once you get your patent, you now have your patent. The patent means that in that particular country, I have filed an application, I have had it examined by an examiner in each of the countries, whether it be Canada, the US, Japan, wherever. I have, it has been amended because we tweak the wording a bit. We, we look at prior art, we consider, hey, maybe that is prior art. Okay, well, I can't claim that because this has been prior art. You narrow it down, you get your set of claims that you're happy with, you've got an issued patent. Now what? Well, you've got a patent. And that lasts from f retroactively from the 12 months, this is from here, if you filed an earlier one. So, tw so it starts here, 20 years from that. You have then issued patents in each of those countries for that period of time. Yes? So with your PCT, because it's still not a, a patent, you can't publish it, disclose it at conferences or so on. It still has to be kept secret until you've actually got your patent where you talk about it at the insurance level, correct? No. So that 30 month period, you No, you can. Once you have filed, once you have filed your priority document, right. you've planted your flag, and then you disclose it the, day, the next day. That's still within that 18-month that time period. All that means is that this document won't publish until 18 months. That document itself. If you have not disclosed it any, anywhere else, then that will be the first disclosure of your invention. If you have disclosed it, well, then that would be the first disclosure. Hopefully, it will have been after time zero, you know, maybe somewhere in here at that conference or that paper you published. That just means that that application will publish at 18 months. Again, from within the four corners of the document that you filed at time zero. Yeah. So the publication oh, sorry. of 18 months is a PCT application? It's a PCT application from 12 months. Yes. So the publication for the public, it's a public's right. So, so what happens is there's, uh, you'll, if you look at a PCT document, PCT publication document, you'll see two numbers. One is the filing date, filing number. Usually it's PCT slash two-letter code for the country, CA, for example, uh, the year, 2014, for example, slash, and then a number. Uh, once it publishes at 18 months, you'll see a WO number, WO 2014 slash 12345. And that's just the number, that, the different numbers they give you. Sorry, you had a question? Um, this thing about priority? Yes. It depends, on what you, it depends on what you file when you plant the flag. If you file the U.S. provisional application, it dies at 12 months, which means it dies here, and it, pub it should publish at 18 months, but because it's dead, it won't publish. So it's... Somebody else can file exactly the same application if they, they gave them the priority date. If they file the application after you, uh, well, <laughs> that's, a bit of a, that's a bit of a trick question because it depends on the situation. If you are the first to file and you are in this, say, in this process and someone else filed it, say, six months later, you are entitled to that because you were the first to file. If you dropped it, it was never published. It was never published, so therefore it's not prior art, so that means that they would have, in that particular case, it could. They could have the patent because they're going to they're going to be pursuing it. It's not public, not prior art. If you drop it at the PCT stage where it's already published, then you could it, it, the priority when somebody else gets their patent. When it's already published. So let's say you drop it at the PCT stage yes. at 18 months. And After you don't actually go forward. 
after it's published, yeah. then, then you have made prior art for someone else as of the publication date. As of the publication date. And nobody else can publish it, or nobody else can patent it in that domain anymore? They can't file it after this date because this now constitutes prior art from this time. Regardless so if they, if they filed, it's published. They, you can, people do that. They file an application and they don't do anything with it because they want to Just block, out. block out the rest of the world. It publishes there, you do nothing. Someone else now cannot file here because if they filed here, this now becomes prior art. And your publication, if it was in that case. So they, they can no longer get, um, they cannot, they, they would be knocked out to get a patent based on your prior art. Now, your question, your first question was a, was a little bit about f filing dates. If you had a US application where someone filed and then someone else filed it six months later, if you were the first to file and you still have a U.S. application pending and you're still pursuing it, even if someone filed you the next day, zero plus one day, you were the first to file, you would have the, 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 the privilege of getting the patent. Again, with, with a whole bunch of questions to be asked and answered along the process. Yes, sorry. Yes, Daryl. No, not necessarily. Number one, if, if the trade secret becomes, there's a few things to consider. If the trade secret becomes, is publicly available. So let's say, for example, the Coke, Coca-Cola formula. That's been a trade secret. If they had patented that, the 20 years would have expired. It would have been published. Anyone could have used, made Coke after that point. Um, they did not. They kept it as a trade secret. Now, someone comes along, and, and how they got that formula for Coke did they get it through reverse engineering, or did they get it through stealing it from somebody's office? Let's assume, let's assume that no one's been able to accurately in the last 100 years reverse engineer Coca-Cola. So let's, let's put that off to the side. But they actually stole the formula, and they actually went and got a patent application for it. Let's assume for the sake of argument that, that, that there is no prior art, because no one was able to reverse engineer Coca-Cola, nobody knows what's in Coca-Cola, and therefore the chemistry in the soft drink that is being patented is new, is not obvious. Are you, is the question you're saying is can Coca-Cola sue? Reverse reverse if it's, if, if you've, that's, well that goes back to the disclosure question because if you put a black box on the table and you were to say, well my invention is in that black box, can someone come along and reverse engineer that black box based on your public disclosure? If the answer is yes, that usually is unfortunately uh, uh, prior art. You've, 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 you've uh, disclosed your invention. If they cannot reverse engineer it, then uh, generally speaking, that's not prior art. And it depends on the jurisdiction, but that's usually what the rule is. So if they cannot reverse engineer it... So if I have, sorry, I'm getting too philosophical here, but I okay. have been in this situation before. So if I have the process to make coke, um, I can't go back and sue coke because then you're suing Coke for what purpose, though? Infringement? If I reverse engineer the process to make Coke, Coca-Cola. No, but who are you suing and why? Um, the people that have been doing it as a trade secret within their company. You, you, wouldn't go back, you wouldn't go retroactively and sue them if they are no, 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 I mean going Coca -Cola. forward. If you can prove that, that they are making, using, or selling your invention, and you're, let's assume your invention is valid, your, your patent is valid, uh, that it is it, subject to the scrutiny of prior art, it is considered a valid patent, and Coca-Cola then goes ahead and still makes their same formula that they've been making for 100 years. Going forward, you could sue them for making, using, or selling your acclaimed invention. So one of the risks of relying on trade secret, although it's outside the university context. Yeah. yeah. No, but, but you said it, it could be reverse engineered. It was prior art, so therefore you couldn't because you're both using a publicly available invention. It's in public No, but that, no, but it was saying is the, is the chemistry of the Coca-Cola or the method of manufacturing if it was considered. You said if you could reverse engineer a black box, it becomes prior art. Yeah, but we're assuming that you can't reverse engineer Coca-Cola. But if you, if you have the information, you did reverse engineer it, so it is prior art. No, I was assuming that the information was... Okay. Okay. So I have a wider question. What stage does the invention need to be at to file a patent? Let's say we have a new mouse and we want to file a new mouse. Do I need the mouse or do I need a sound condition of success? Yes. Both. 
Well, both you, 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 it would be advised to have as much data as possible. If you do not have the mouse, you may not, it, it may be an, an obstacle to patentability. It does not mean that you cannot file the application. Uh, again, if sound prediction you mentioned, which is another, which is a whole other topic, but is definitely something to consider, is if you have a, a, pro a project which could go 10 years, you're talking about a drug and drug trials and whether or not it has a particular outcome at the back end. You've only got a year window here <laughs> to make your improvements to do your work. If, if you've got sufficient data, and, and again, sufficient is a, is a subjective question that you need to ask, whereby you can A, produce reproducible results, and you have some kind of basis for, it could work if I had the money and time to do so. The question then you, then you then ask is, do I have that? And if the answer is yes, it usually is a good opportunity to file. One thing to consider though, and, and it happens, is where if you are making improvements and it, say it takes you 17 months, sometimes you buy yourself an extra few months because you can file an application here, file another application here just before this one first publishes, and then you kind of, you kind of piggyback on it. Now you're not evergreening, which is a term that we use for prolonging the patent life beyond the 20 years, but you can, you can look at things on a staggered basis, and that can, that can sort of give you a, a portfolio where you have a laddered approach to your, your protection, depending on the situation. Yes? Can I ask, is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. So, so one of the thing, questions we've had, so um, we're designing a, a uh, implant. I mean, I've tested it, and I'd say it works in the airway. You know, I'm pretty speculative. I can make it look that hard. You talk about the four corners. Um, can you make patents that are so broad that I can, can encompass everything about you? Or is that wrong? Okay. Or it's, there's, there's two sides to that. Can you make a patent application that is sufficiently broad that includes things that may or may not work? You can draft anything you want in a patent application. Is the patent going to issue, number one, and is it going to be held up in a court of law, heaven forbid, down the road, number two? That's a whole other set of questions. If you say that, well, I've tested it in this implant in liver and kidney, but I haven't tested it in heart or brain, and I want to do that, you can soundly predict, meaning that it should work, based on the experiments that we've done to date, work in many different organs, especially if they have a particular cell type, for example, or if they had a particular morphology that you're looking at. If, they, if it's something that can extend logically, we, we, there's a test in Canada of sound prediction which is founded on a factual basis, a sound line of reasoning, and proper disclosure. What that means is if you can establish to the satisfaction of an examiner, and ultimately to a, a court if it ever got to litigation, that I tested it in A, B, and C models, but I haven't tested it in D, E, F, but it should work and I should be granted protection for D, E, and F. And you have accurately, properly, soundly predicted that it could work in D, E, and F, even if you haven't tested it, then that could be, you could sufficiently have a proper patent application and a proper patent. So there is no requirement to test all possible embodiments of an invention. There is no requirement, and, and sometimes in many jurisdictions, you don't have to limit it only to your examples. So your claims, as at the back end of the patent, are what defines the, the fence, the meets and bounds of your invention. You can say to, to an implant for uh, implanting into an organ, full stop. Well, an examiner might say, well, I've seen prior art in, in, in ABC. Okay, well, then you can maybe whittle it down a little bit. Or they might say, your application only teaches two organs. How can you claim every organ? Well, then you have to argue, well, I'm soundly predicting. I can predict that it should work in organs F, G, H, I, J. Or you might say, you know what, I don't know if it's going to work. I don't have the budget, I don't have the time, it might work 10 years from now, I don't care, I just want my patent, and I'll, I'll take it for the two that I've got. Now, can others make, use, or sell outside of those two that you've actually tested? Yes. If you claim an implant for use in heart and liver, and you haven't tested it in kidney, and you don't claim kidney, someone comes along and tests it in kidney, then they are outside the, your fence, and they can, you, don't, you can't sue them. But if you, if you claim an organ, that's where it keeps it broad. If it is a valid patent, uh, that is, there's no prior art, and everything is good down the prosecution pathway, and you claim an organ, you basically claim everything. So anyone who takes any organ with, any, with your implant is going to be found infringing. And that's, infringement is the process where someone is making, using, or selling your claimed invention. 
That's where you stop them. That's where you tell them to go away. So is it valid to file the application? Yes. Is it going to get a valid patent? It might. Could you get it? You might. And, and if it does work, congratulations. That's, that's, that's what the goal is. Where do you draw the line with your fence? Yes, Elizabeth. So if someone finds that uh, uh, your plan doesn't work in the kidney, does it jeopardize your patent? Yeah. Kidney? If you claim it in kidney, yes. So if you claim it and it doesn't work? If you claim it works in kidney and it doesn't work in kidney, and uh, this, is, this is in the, the third, which you can't really see, the third module, which is enforcement. If it ever got to a court and they said, well, it doesn't work in kidney. We've test, we have expert witnesses who have tested this. It does not work. You claim it works. That could invalidate, it can validate the claim, it could invalidate the part of the claim, it could invalidate the whole patent. It depends on what was actually disclosed. Okay, I know we're a little bit over time. We were supposed to go, a few, I was uh, hoping to go a little bit past 11 just for questions and stuff. But we'll go to the, the last part of the, of the talk, which is now you've got a patent. So congratulations, you've got a patent. You've got claims that you're happy with. Your application has the fence that you're happy with. You've got, maybe you've got some investors on board. Uh, and now you, wanna, you have a patent. You've got your issued patent in the U.S., Canada, Japan, wherever you like. It's only as good as what you do with it. And it could be a technical tool, a strategic tool, or a marketing tool. If you want to advertise on your website, on your, on your lab, that you've got uh, 50 patents granted in different jurisdictions, that could be perfect. That looks great on a CV. That's, that's fantastic. That could look great in a, in a grant application. Uh, if you want to use it strategically, though, then you have to think about it. And again, those questions that we asked earlier, what is my market? Can I use this patent to enforce it in, in Japan because I know that there's competitors there? Do I have a, a, a distributor? Am I actually going to be flying over to Tokyo a couple times a year to see that, 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 that they're making my product, they're selling it, and then no one else is infringing? Remember, the patent excludes others. It doesn't, it doesn't give you the, the inclusive rights. It excludes others. So is there, are there people out there infringing, making my, my invention, my claimed invention? Do you have people there who want to, to they're, they're, they legitimately want to use your invention, but they don't want to be sued? They're, then you can license them out for a royalty. So you say you can use, make use or sell my claimed invention in exchange for 10% of the revenues down, downstream. That, that, could be, that could be done. It could be, as, as was mentioned, about, about blocking out other people. That's, that could be a brilliant tool. Now, getting a patent and blocking it out might be a little bit extreme because, as you can appreciate, there's costs, there's time involved, there's legwork. Getting it published might be sufficient. It's a published application. You can't do anything. You can't enforce it but you prevented others from getting that patent. That could be a very strategic tool as well. So it all depends on what your ultimate goal is down the road. One other thing you have to consider, and this is, goes under the other side of the question. Now you've got your patent which blocks others from making, using, or selling. What if the shoe's on the other foot? Someone else has got a patent. They're preventing you from making, using, or selling. And that is a term you may hear, FTO, or freedom to operate. Do I have the freedom to operate? That is, can I make, use, or sell a, 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 my invention, or a product, or a chemical, a device, whatever, in a particular jurisdiction? You got to be careful. It's a whole other set of questions to ask. It's a whole other set of results. But if I'm going to be selling a particular widget in Canada, I have to make sure, I should make sure, that no one else has a patent which covers my widget. And depending on how crafty their patent agent was, and depending on the prior art, and depending on a whole other bunch of things, if their claims of their patent are sufficiently broad to cover your widget, you can't sell it for fear of being sued by the owner of that patent. Or you want to go into a license agreement with them, and then you pay them royalties. There may be a different agreement that, 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 uh, that can, uh, can happen. But it's a separate question to ask. It's the, other, it's the flip side of, of patent protection, is when you are now the actual making, using, or selling of that invention. And that, I don't want to go, that's a whole other lecture, that's a whole other talk, but that's something to keep in mind when you look at the various jurisdictions that you're going into. All right, just to wrap it up, um, it's patenting uh, is, is I, I like to think, and, I, and as I say, I've, I've been in the academic setting and I've been in the legal setting. It is a logical and necessary extension of research and development. It is a mechanism to provide you with revenue stream, provide you with exposure, to provide you with, with, with collaborations, which can be done in many different forums. But one thing I stress, and I stress it, number one, do not disclose your invention. 
it's, it's really easy to go out and put a poster on, on front of your lab and show the world, hey, look at me. That's fantastic. If you're going to be filing a patent application, if you want to get this patent protected, if you're looking at possible business development down the road, before you put it on your wall, even if it's outside the wall in this, in this, in this building, if you think about it, if it's a public, some guy off the street could come along, walk in the building, look up and see it, take notes and say, down the road after you got your issued patent, this was disclosed on such and such a date, I'll swear an affidavit to say that it was. And it's important that before you do anything, if you are looking about patent protection, that you, that you keep it under wraps. Keep it within the four corners of your lab. The four corners is a, is a, is a, is a, a big expression we use in the legal profession. The four corners of your patent document, the four corners of your lab, your collaborators, your immediate, your immediate family, if you will, in, in the lab. Um, if you have any questions on that, uh, ask, 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 always ask. I'm here to help, um, and I'm happy to uh, answer any more questions, uh, but I I'm, I'm, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I know it's been a lot of stuff, um, but if you have any questions, I'll be here a little bit while, while, while longer to, uh, to address them. Thank you very much for your time. Yes. Um, so in an academic lab where you have grad students working on a supervisor project at a university lab with external funding, um, who would own the rights to a patent and who would be able to profit from it among those different groups? That's, that, uh, that, that depends on a lot of different things. Um, if the university has uh, clauses in employment contracts in which the individual lab uh, PI has rights to that invention. The university might have rights to the invention. Um, the the collaborator might have a certain degree of rights to the invention. Uh, it, it, it's a it's a lot of questions that that are rightly asked. Uh, the answers may not be necessarily clear. Uh, they should be crystallized as soon as possible. Generally speaking, though, with respect to whether or not you have collaborators, um, it depends on the situation, but. If someone was, was entrusted to do a particular experiment and they had no inventive contribution to that other than simply to follow instructions, generally speaking, they're not an inventor and generally speaking, uh, they, would, they would not be entitled to uh, any benefits, uh, commercial benefits down the road. Um, so it depends on the, the nature of the collaboration. If they actually contributed to the quote unquote invention as opposed to simply to carrying out a routine task then they would be entitled to uh, the benefits of that. Um, uh, if there's any agreements that you would sign between collaborators, between universities, between granting agencies, uh, that would all be part and parcel of, of the documentation that, uh, that, that would have to be considered, whether or not there's any provisions in there for ownership of certain agencies or otherwise.